Tom Rob Smith uh, pretty much took everybody by surprise with a book called Child 44 a few years ago. I think it landed with the kind of impact that Gorky Park did. It was often compared to that book, and I think that he will be remembered much the way that Martin Cruz Smith has in writing something that, though within the genre, sort of redefines it. It granted a, a depth and a gravitas that was, uh, to those of us who love the genre, was, was really welcome. It was a big, chewy, wonderful, historical uh, mystery thriller that was just an eye-opener. And the trilogy that, that resulted from the book is also going to be something I think is going to stand for a long time. However, he's now come up with a book called The Farm. And um, I don't get to read for pleasure very often anymore. I think this is, the read, this is the writer's curse. We just don't get to read what we want to read very often. But I was given this book, I was going to introduce him, and this is the dirty little secret. You say, sure I will. And then you say, okay, I'll read 25 pages or something. Mm -hmm. Just so I'm familiar with the book, and I won't look like a complete idiot. And then I'll introduce him, we'll meet him, we'll talk about the book. And so I started uh, one night, beginning to read the book, figuring out to get in my 25 pages. At 2 o'clock, I had gotten to page 125, and I had to stop because I had to get up the next morning at 6. And this has been a book that I have not been able to stop reading. In fact, uh, you know that Elaine always says, we want you around so the participants can see you. This morning, I played hooky so I could read a little bit more of it. This is one of the most engaging, entertaining, wonderful books I've picked up in a very, very long time. I can't recommend it more highly. I'm going to let him talk about it. I won't spoil it for you. Uh, his, the gentleman to his right is Otto Penzler. And Otto has published more of the great names in crime fiction than anyone else. And he's also responsible for the Best American Mystery uh, Series. He's a co-editor each year of that with a mystery writer who serves as his co-editor. And they choose the best mystery stories each year. Um, the thing that is always impressing about Otto is that Otto always makes it clear that he's never thought of the crime genre as the, the stepson of any other type of literary genre. He knows that it is a great American legacy. He, he loves it, he appreciates it, he respects it, and he always looks, seeks out and finds the excellence within it. So with that introduction, I leave it to Tom Rob Smith and Otto Pinsler to converse. <laughs> I know this is supposed to be a conversation between uh, Tom and, and me, but I, so many of you know about me, and there's really not that much that's all that interesting. So most of this will be devoted to Tom, uh, quite rightly. Besides, I, I read all four of the books, and uh, I, I, I don't want to waste all that research, so we'll, we'll be talking about it a little bit. Um, I want to start with, uh, in, at the beginning, kind of, if you'll, I'm going to talk for a little while, so just make yourself at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, with Child 44, which was the first book, um, I had an editor for a, a book of mine. The very first book that he ever edited uh, was a book that I did with Delaware, a book called Murder and Obsession, an anthology. And a very lovely fellow. We became pretty good friends over time. And we would have lunch once or twice a year. And once in all the time, all the, all the years that, that we've known each other, and I guess it was about 15 years, he um, brought a book with him to lunch. And he said, I know you never have time to read. I said, I don't. I'm not, don't even give it a man. I, I, it's impossible. Between all the short stories that I have to read every year for all the anthologies that I do, and one year I had eight anthologies, which was ridiculous. Uh, all the manuscripts that I read for uh, the publishing company that I run, I just, I don't have time to read for fun. Don't just take it away. He said, I've never done this before to you in all the years we've known each other. I'm insisting that you read this book and it's child for And I took it home and I promised him I would read it and I was doing what we just did about the farm. I thought I'm gonna read a little bit just to make Mitch Hoffman happy. And, um, and get to know a little bit. I have probably read six books in my life that I could almost quote verbatim. 
because it moved me so powerfully. Six books in my life, probably, that I would read a second time. And Child 44 was one of those books. The opening scene. Of, I'm going to stop for a minute to give you the bad news. It's gone out of stock. There's a movie, which we're going to talk about. There's a movie. And so the publisher has let the old book sell out, which in many printings, so it's sold out, because they want to have a movie tie-in cover. As a result, you can't buy a copy of the book tonight. Idiots. No. There is no copy to be had. The publisher is sold out. The wholesalers are sold out. Bookstore is sold out. That's it. So I'm just interrupting to let you know that when you're done hearing me rave about what a great book this is, you can't buy one tonight. But a lot of you live in the neighborhood. Come back. You get the new movie tie-in cover. The opening scene doesn't sound like much. It's a boy trying to catch a cat. And as a little time goes by, we learn why he's trying to catch this cat. It's because he and his family are starving. And it's the last cat in the village in Russia. This is during the era of Stalin. And the suspense of this scene, knowing that it could be the difference between life and death because of the starvation, was so intense that I was hyperventilating as I was reading this. I've read a lot of crime fiction in my life. I've read a lot of mystery stories, suspense stories, crime stories. It's the single most suspenseful scene I've ever read. And you wrote it. Um, it's a story that, that's set in Stalinist Russia. It, has, it is filled with historical accuracy and, uh, and excitement. Uh, it was a dreadful time. The people in that place, in that time, had a horrible, horrible experience. And it all comes through in this book. It's a, it's a novel of suspense. It's a novel of politics. It's a novel of murder. It's about a serial killer based on a true story. And uh, it all comes wrapped together in the middle of it is one of the most poignant and beautiful love stories that you could ever find. It is as close to a perfect book as I can remember reading in 20 years. Wow. And that's, and for those, a lot of you don't know me, you've never seen me before. Those of you who do, admit it, you have never heard me <laughs> praise a book this heavily ever in your lives, right? And I'm not making it up because I'm not polite enough to make it up. <laughs> it was followed by uh, a second book featuring the same hero. And there's no other word that would do for this character uh, other than hero. Uh, a member of what had been the KGB. I always forget the, the, the letters. It was yeah, I mean, the Secret the, Service. The, the, the MGB, KGB. Yeah, and whatever. The Secret Service. Um, who decides that he's going to go and solve crimes anyway, even though the official policy is there are no crimes in the Soviet Union. And he, is, he risks his life and his family's life by deciding to go after this serial killer of young boys. And Child 44 refers to the 44th victim. This was followed by uh, a, a second book featuring the same hero called um, The Secret Letter, in which um, Stalin is given a very hard time by the new, uh, by the new prime minister. And, and this was uh, the premier, we call him, president, premier, uh, ruler. Um, and this is, it's not supposed to be known that, uh, that this is out there. And it's a second book, a little more political perhaps uh, than the first, and followed by yet a third book called Agent Six. Um, this, all three books are just beautifully written, spectacular, and we're having tremendous success 
And then with this tremendous success, Tom Rob Smith decided to write something not in the series. <laughs> <laughs> As a publisher, this drives you nuts. What are you doing? And he wrote a book called The Farm, which has, I don't know if it's the best premise for, for a novel that I've ever read, but it's damn close. Listen to this. Young man is in London. He gets a phone call from his, from his mother saying, they're out to get me, she's sounding paranoid, she's uh, being forced into a hospital, and, um, no, I'm sorry, I take it back, I take it back, I got it wrong, sorry. Boy's father calls and says his mother has lost her mind, she's crazy, uh, they've had to hospitalize her for her own sake, uh, it's really horrible, uh, I'm so sorry to tell you about this. A little while later, it gets another phone call. It's from his mother saying, I know you've heard from your father. Everything he says is a lie. I'm fine. They're, they're out to get me. This is a family that this boy knew as a loving couple, a warm, wonderful, close-knit family. And that's the premise. And I haven't given away anything that happens in the first 20 pages or so. Okay, Tom was about 11 when he wrote uh, Child 44. <laughs> you, were, you were still in university, weren't you, when you started? Um, no, I, I finished university, yeah. but I, yeah, I, I was uh, like 23, so I was just uh, working on some stuff. 23, I, I rest my case, it was 11. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing at this point. How did you, how did you manage to do the research, first of all, to learn as much as you did and absorb it so fully, and at the same time, learn to structure a novel, a first novel, that was as complex and rich as this one. How in the world did you do that? I think everybody here would like to know that. Um, the research question is interesting uh, because you know, everyone is always talking about why should you do a degree, what's the point of a university degree, and what's even more pertinent, what's the point of an English literature degree. Um, it was often said to me when I was studying literature, what is the use of this? And uh, obviously I love stories and it felt, it felt wonderful to me, but there was a secondary use, which is going to university makes you confident enough to go into a library and think if I don't know anything about a subject all I do is take all these books off the shelf go and read them and I can learn about it uh, and it's a strange confidence that actually lots of people don't have lots of people are intimidated by libraries lots of people are intimidated by books and so when I came to writing Child 44 I thought I love the story which I stumbled across by chance and I thought, I have to love the research. So I went into a bookstore in, in London and I just bought these books. And I thought if I read them and I enjoy reading them, I can write Child 44 because I love the research. Now if you look back, I think, you know, if I didn't have had, if I didn't have had that degree, if I didn't have that confidence, I would have found that research very intimidating. I mean, academic books, uh, I'm sure as a publisher, you know, they have very drab covers. Um, not very reader friendly. You know, it's like you often they often just have some text on it. I mean, they're not they're not they don't leap at you and say read me. But you know, you pick it up and actually they were wonderful books. And um, I love the research and that that was the point I knew I could write the book. I thought not only am I enjoying reading this, stuff is leaping at me. So you mentioned the opening of Child Forty Four that came from. I mean, historians have a very particular way of writing about the world, which is very different to the way fiction writers write about the world. And um, this one historian was just documenting lots of pieces of information, and it was very interesting. But he just sort of summarized what was happening, and he said, in these villages where starvation was common, the first thing that disappeared were domestic animals, moved on to then other points about um, um, the, the nature of the starvation in the village. And I thought, what if someone and I'm sure that was true in 99.9% .9 of cases. I'm sure everyone, if you're starving, you would eat your dog or your cat. But what if there was one person who decided, actually, I would rather, you know, it was, it was a line I'm not going to cross. I love this animal. Uh, I know that psychologically I might survive for another week, 
but I know that probably I'll die anyway, and I can't make that psychological... You know, I'd rather die now than die in a week. Now, as a historian, you'd be like, well, maybe that person existed. I don't have a document that says that person existed. As a fiction writer, you can imagine that person, and you can bring that person to life. And so that was the way in. It was this tiny little seed in a research book that a historian had put in, and I thought, let's flip that upside down and do what a fiction writer can do and write about the exception rather than the rule. The, the one man who hadn't eaten his cat. Yeah, yeah. And somebody else was going to eat it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you, had you read a lot of crime, mystery, suspense, thriller fiction so that you had some idea of how to, to do this thing? Uh, you know, in terms of my taste, I'd always read a lot of everything. I never re this is the strange thing, I've never really had a clear set of rules about what I should read. Um, and I remember one of the books I absolutely, there have been two books that I absolutely loved as a, as a teenager, were Jurassic Park and Silence of the Lambs. And I remember having no dividing line between them in my brain, even though clearly they are very different books. To me, they were, I mean, they were this utterly captivating. I remember reading them, you know, totally caught up in this world, not wanting them to end. The feeling in, my, in, in me as a person, as a reader, was identical for both. And in my head, I've always paired them. Now, clearly, if you're a publisher, you're looking, well, that's science fiction, you know, that's this and that. They're totally different. Um, so I was always very relaxed about those kind of lines. I read a lot of, 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 um, of everything. I read very widely. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, to try to call Cal 44 a thriller is like calling 1984 a science fiction novel. I mean, the real, it's a real novel, and it happens to involve some people who are murdered and somebody who decides to, to stop it. But the historical elements of it and the romantic elements of it are every bit as important and every bit as real uh, as, as the criminal elements. So James Crumley, the great James Crumley, uh, who wrote the greatest private eye novel ever written, a book called The Last Good Kiss, once said, I don't write crime novels, I write novels in which a crime takes place. And I think that's a fair description of any good, really good crime novel. Uh, there are novels first, and then there are also crime novels. <clears throat> um, when you, you, had, you enjoyed great success pretty quickly with Child 44, uh, did that spur you to write another book about the same character, or had you already decided that you wanted to do uh, a series uh, about this character? Yeah, the series uh, was born uh, very early on, long before it was published. I mean, there's always this lead-in of a year or so um, on your first book before it gets published, uh, you know, the editing process. So um, I decided during that year to start work on the uh, the second book, and I knew at that point that it would be a trilogy. I mean, I think the interesting thing about that historical period is it gives you a very compressed set of time, uh, and each part of the book is in such a very different historical period. So you have Khrushchev and the collapse, um, really, of confidence in Stalinism and this change, and then you have the Afghanistan War, which is really about the end of communism. And so it was possible to set one person's life against the life of this regime, and that was the, the shape of the trilogy. So I knew that shape, and I decided that that, that trilogy was born sort of in that year of, of editing. It wasn't decided before Child 40 was, Child 44 was written because I didn't even know if it would get published. So I hadn't even thought beyond it being published. In fact, and in fact, I remember when I finished Child 44, and I sent the manuscript off to my agent, I remember my strategy, and everyone has strategies for dealing with failure, but my strategy was always to start work on something else mm -hmm. and to totally throw yourself into it so that when, and I expected failure to come, you can then divert that energy into whatever you're working on. It's a, it's a clever technique, so then you don't just wallow in misery <laughs> for, for months. Your, your shell, your, your exactly. turtle shell. Yeah. Um, and when you finish the trilogy, you you made a conscious decision not to continue writing Russian novels, not to do this. Um, I'll ask the obvious question. Would, might you go back someday and, and do another? Um, I feel like the end of Age of Six is Leo's, is Leo's last sort of moment in fiction. I can't imagine what I would do with that character. Um, 
that I haven't already done. I feel like the journey is complete in that sense. Um, I always think it's dangerous to say never, never yeah. um, but I'm as close to saying that as I could. I'm sort of prudence stops me from completely saying it. But I feel like I've done it. I feel like, you know, I've done it. And, um, and you didn't kill him. Uh, I didn't, exactly. I can't, you know, pull him from the grave. Um, no, but uh, I mean, it feels like it's done. It feels like it's done. Okay. Um, now, I, I, I gave the, the premise, even though I got it wrong for a second, uh, I gave the premise for the farm, which is, as David was saying, an absolute white knuckle read because uh, it's very, it reminded me in many ways as it progressed of a novel that Patricia Highsmith might have written. Uh, she never liked to use the term uh, suspense. She liked to use the term unease. It's a novel of unease. And The Farm, to me, is a novel of unease. Because you, you never get your bearings. As the reader, you don't know who's telling the truth. And what I just described goes back and forth several times as the book progresses. Uh, mother is saying, they're, they're out to get me. This happened, this happened, and I see how these things were, were aimed at me. Uh, father saying, no, she's crazy. She's, you know, this, this isn't true. What she's saying isn't true. She's saying he's lying. He, you know, this goes on and on. And you can't get quite your, your sea legs, you know, you can't quite Managed to get your, your total bearings. How did you manage to do that? It's very, very different in style, very different in scope, much smaller uh, landscape. Uh, how did you adjust so widely, so hugely? Um, so, I mean, there are, I guess, two elements of that. First of all, to why I wrote the book in the first place, and then the actual nature of. of, of creating it once I was creating it. So are you asking me both or do you, do you want to know why? Do you yeah, want to know why? Knock yeah. yourself out, it's your turn. Uh, the why is, the why is, um, uh, it's the, the farm is based on something that happened in my life actually. Uh, whilst I was writing Agent Six, I got a call from my dad. And my dad said, your mom is in an asylum in Sweden. And they have retired to a farm in Sweden. My dad is English, my mom is uh, Swedish. And he said, she's sick, you need to come out. Um, you need to come and see her. I had no idea anything was going on. They seemed very happy. They'd have been out there for two years or something. And, they, and it, was, it was a complete surprise. So I book a flight. The flight goes the next day. Before I can take that flight, I get a call from my mother. And she's left the hospital. She says, everything your father has told you is a lie. Um, I am not mad. Your dad is involved in a criminal conspiracy. And I'm coming to London to tell you the truth. And so it's not a novel, it's a journalistic. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 the fiction is everything that it, in the book, um, you have that setup which we have we've given you. Uh, and then she arrives and she says, take me back to your apartment. And I took her back to my apartment in real life and she told me a, a series of strange vignettes. Now I knew the farm very well, so it would, uh, it, was a, it was a very different conversation. What I've done in the book is create an entire fiction. And the fiction, I was trying to capture that sense of unease. So in the real events, which um, are very different in the sense of what she was talking about, I had this feeling of, I don't know who to believe. So that was what I was trying to capture. And I was, had to try and create a story, a fictional story with fictional events that captured the real unease that I felt during those four hours I was listening to my mom. So it's taking that premise and saying, because it's a very different, I mean, if I'd sort of written a, a, a sort of direct um, a, a version of the actual conversation that took place that night, A, my mum was speaking shorthand because um, I knew the farm very well and I knew everyone out there. Um, B, it wouldn't really have made sense. It, C, it was just a series of little bits and it was just a sensation rather than uh, a, a narrative. It wasn't really a story. It was just, I think this person is, is involved in this. It wasn't really, it didn't hold up as a, as a thing. So I had to, again, it was like fiction steps into a gap there at that point. How can I use a story that is totally fabricated to capture something that was true? Um, and I wanted to put you, the reader, in the position that I was in that night of not being sure. You have to decide whether this woman speaking is telling the truth or is she making something up. 
<clears throat> are the uh, the two parents very similar to your parents? I mean, in appearance and the way they speak and the, 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 their manners. Uh, uh, the female, the, the woman seems much more uh, excitable, much more volatile. The the man seems much quieter and calmer. Is that is that kind of how your parents are? Uh, no, I mean then it's it's very strange. I have to say, even the I mean, even when you try to write down an exact version of yourself, even when you try not to fictionalize it at all, what comes out is nothing like you. It's that even if you're trying your very hardest to capture you, it starts to move away in this strange way. And in this event, I wasn't even trying to do that. And suddenly you feel the pull of fiction in a very... The, the truth is, I and my parents had always had a very tempestuous relationship. Uh, we never really hit anything. We were always... Arguments would happen right in front of us. You know, we, every, we knew everything more or less about each other. And I thought this story would be much more interesting for the protagonist the person who was, in a sense, in the role that I had that night, to really have never seen any of his parents' secrets. To be one of these children who had grown up and been protected from all of that. And I knew some people like that, who had never, and this is, I, I was always stunned when I first heard him say this, but he had never seen his parents argue, not once. They'd never raised their voice in front of them. I thought that was a great character for a book, suddenly <laughs> thrown into this dilemma because this person is entirely ill-equipped to deal with this. And that was when, you said that's in a sense how the fiction develops and pulls you in different, in different directions. Yeah, yeah, I mean it does come as a surprise, surprise to him to, to learn all of this. And we, we, we can't talk too much more about it, otherwise we'll give away too much. Uh, and I, I cannot recommend this book too highly. I share everything that David said about the, uh, the brilliance of this book. Uh, you haven't finished it yet, though, have you? Um, I had to come and do this, otherwise yeah. I'd be in my room reading it now. Yeah, I'm glad you okay. <laughs> uh, Yeah, well, there are copies here, I know, and uh, I think you, would, everybody who reads it will be happy and, and thank us all for, uh, for recommending this book to you. Uh, now, I know that you're working on some teleplays. Are you writing another novel? you have another novel in mind before we get to the cinema? Yeah, I am. Yes, I'm working on a TV series at the moment. So the book, the new book is, it's a little, it's pushed back a little bit. I am started the research on that. So it's funny that we're now talking about research because I'm at the very early stage. And um, I actually was in, um, actually when I saw you in New York, I had gone and, um, bought lots of books on this subject, and I'd gone to the Strand Bookstore, and um, it's, uh, I couldn't buy them in your bookstore, by the way, otherwise I would have bought them there. You're damn right. <laughs> yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they, they were a subject that you don't stock. Um, otherwise, all these telling for yours. Um, but um, I don't know, so it's like at that very early stage, what I love to do is like fill a bookshelf, and you buy lots of books that are not so great and lots of books that are amazing but it's this early stage it's a wonderful stage and actually i'm going to probably write this book in new york partly because um uh my my, my london study just feels so seeped in russian books you know right. it's like this book needs a new space it's very strange writing i think you know in it's, it's like and, and this tally series that i'm writing it feels seeped in I walk in there and I'm like, this isn't this isn't the right place to write this book. Where is the where's the next book set? Um, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> um, now I understand that there is a movie coming out of uh, Child 44. Uh, do you, what do you know about it? I, I, uh, I actually this saw This is a setup. We have, we've actually talked about this for 20 minutes outside. <laughs> it, said, I, I knew it was very natural. It was very good. Pretty I good. Good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> I actually, before I came here, I, um, I was in LA and I saw a, um, a screening of Child 44, the movie. And uh, it doesn't come out for a while, but it is, it is, it is really a wonderful, wonderful movie. I was, and we were saying the word that really sums up the feeling is relief. I mean, because you sit there thinking, you know, they spend so much money and time, and I like all the people involved. I want to get to the end and not have to lie. You want to be able to look at them and say, wow, you know, you've done a great job. And it's interesting, as we were talking about the book, um, 
just just there. Um, you know, the book has many elements, and in a book you can dance around in a way that in a movie is very tricky. I mean, the movie is two hours, 11 minutes, and um, you have very little time. And I was hoping when I sat down in this editing suite to watch it, that the one thing that would really come across was the love story. And it really does. It's just, it's wonderful to watch. And um, Tom Hardy plays Leo, Nomi Rapace plays um, Raisa, and she is sensational. I mean, she is just amazing. Um, so, you know, I was thrilled. I was really proud and, and moved to some of the scenes. And um, uh, yeah, I'm excited for you to see it in, in April. That's, that's the US release date. Not till April. Yeah, it's very. Uh, I, I could. I could. Uh, your books sales until April. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, there we. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, that's uh, I'm gonna, you'll need that, that question to uh, my <laughs> <mom's> later. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll have to break. What they were. It's so the tie-in edition. I mean, it's. I've never had a tie-in edition before. They have to get the artwork released from the studio. The studio doesn't want to release it to the last minute. Mm -hmm. Everyone is. It's like a million emails going back and forth. Everyone begging for things. Not. I mean, it's. It's weird watching it. You kind of have no power. And then suddenly the date moves, and suddenly everyone can relax. So I guess what they're going to have to do is bring out now. They won't get the artwork. I think probably till a bit further down. So they'll have to bring out some interim. Let's version. hope so. Yeah. yeah. Let's hope so. Um, and um, what about the TV series? You're writing a TV series. Yeah, in fact, I've it, been writing it myself here. Um, it's, it goes on in, a, in uh, October. Um, they start filming in October, rather. It goes on in April. Actually, oh my God, at the same time as Child 44. <laughs> Big month. Yeah, a lot of things. The cruelest month. month. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, no. So yeah, so that's that's very exciting. That's five episodes. Um, it will be on in America. I'm not sure of the American uh, distributor yet, but it will come here. And that is a, a thriller, a spy thriller set in London, uh, a mini series. Um, so, and that is uh, with Ben Whishaw. You didn't know? Have you seen the new James Bond movie? Uh, with Sam Mendes one. Uh, the guy who plays the new Q is the lead. He's a really great actor, called Ben Whishaw. Title? London Spy. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because when you when I come up with titles with that one, I was like, it was at the very beginning, and I was like, it's a spy thriller set in London. It's London Spy. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure out. I'll figure out the title later. <laughs> and it just it, everyone. It, just, it hasn't been done. No one's taken it. So it's like I, I was, <laughs> like too, was, easy. Yeah. too easy again. Too easy. Again. <laughs> it's terrible. We were speaking earlier about how I didn't have enough scars. I didn't have enough war wounds. And so this has all come way too easy. Your first book, you're 11 years old, and you know it becomes a, not only a brilliant book with great critical praise everywhere, but then becomes a New York Times bestseller. Then the, the next books come out, the, the praise again, and they sell. And then the farm comes out, it's brilliant. The, you know, it's going to be another best song. A movie is made and it turns out good. It's like, God, you know, it's all too easy for you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, I'm looking back thinking there were moments where, which were tricky. But the oh. truth is, oh. but the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, in the scheme of things, I have been exceptionally lucky. There's no doubt about that. And I actually, uh, sometimes whenever you're feeling a bit, you know, as we all, as writers, always have a tendency to feel slightly sorry for ourselves at times, <laughs> I have to remind myself, if you had told me that it's age 13, I was like, why are you moaning? This is fantastic. This yeah. is amazing. You know, I, I, I am living a very privileged <coughs> right. and lucky existence. But, but also, let's, let's acknowledge, tremendous amount of work yeah. went into it. Yeah. The, the, re, the hours of research, the, the writing and rewriting, and all of the hard work that went in. But, but I love it. You know, this is the, this is the thing. It's funny. Often in interviews, they say, what do you do to relax? And I'm like, oh, I love movies. I love books. I love theater. I love story. I'm doing the thing I love. If I wasn't writing, I'd be doing all that stuff anyway. I just had to sort of squeeze it around you know, my occupation. So the truth is, when we talk about work, I, I, I feel... You know, I'm, I love it. You know, the research, even the research, people would talk about it as, as being difficult. I would just say then you're probably researching a subject that you're not engaging with in the right way. I mean, find a different one. Because I know when I come up with an idea whether the research is going to grab me or not. And if it's not going to grab you, you have to find another idea. Because it has to feel, it has to feel fun. It has to feel, there has to be some love. I think that comes through in the pages. Otherwise, I don't know. 
That's my sense anyway. So even the work, I feel, I feel, you know, lovely. Even the work. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any justice? Look, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, maybe we should open for questions. Would that be okay? Sure. Yes. Is that permitted here? <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, it's your show. It's, oh, it's, 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 it's our show. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Or have we answered absolutely everything that you could possibly want to know? The first question is always the hardest. So just go for it. There we go. I'll start. Did anyone reject child 42? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So this is the, I, I mean, it was so relatively quickly. So there was no tale of woe. But um, the, I got a call from my my agent and he said, Someone had rejected, didn't tell me who, but he, and he also used, and I, and this was in the stage where I expected it to be rejected, so I was waiting for the news, and he said, they didn't want, they didn't want to publish it, but you have made a fan, and I was like, has there ever been a sadder phrase? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a fan, I want to be published. <laughs> I just remember, here, and I was walking, I remember exactly where I was on the street, walking down, and I heard that call, and I was no. <laughs> oh, good. If it gets published, I'll sell one copy. <laughs> I've got a fan. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. What does that even mean? So he's, so I think it was a he. Um, he was basically saying, yeah, if, if someone else publishes it, I'll buy it. But I'm not going to publish it. That's terrible. Yeah. This is more for, um, I've heard more than one person up there talk about Child 44 as having had some revolutionary impact on the thriller genre. Is that can you say why that might be true? If it is, a revolution did the. If, for anybody who didn't hear it, uh, the 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 question is uh, or statement really is uh, that Chop Forty Four had a revolutionary impact on the thriller. Is that what you? That's that what I heard. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's it, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean there have been many books. Uh, that have used a great historical background in the thriller genre, um, and have used the Soviet Union uh, in the thriller genre, and all good novels have some element of romance and suspense. It may have been better than almost anything else, but uh, but change the face of the thriller? I don't think so, no. No, I, I, would, I would also just add it. It is seat in the tradition. I mean, it does some things that are different, but every book should try and do things that are different. I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't. I never saw it as a radical. I never sat down and thought, I'm going to break the back of the thriller thing. And uh, no, it never crossed my mind. I think it is a book very much in love with the tradition. I think you know you have to take that love and think, well, I can't, you can't repeat the things that I love. That's the only thing. I don't. I, I never saw it as, as no. I'm glad you agree, because otherwise I'd be kind of offended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And God knows I would never want to offend anyone. <laughs> yeah? What drew you to that time era? Uh, well, the true, the true story was the way in. And uh, the true story was uh, the case of Andrew Chikatilo, who actually they've turned into a, I mean, there's a, a, a famous non-fiction book about it called The Killer Department, mm -hmm. which was turned, I think, into an HBO series with you know, that, that was, I think, a mini-series, or maybe it was a movie. It was just a movie, movie. Citizen X, was that the one That's Stephen it. Ray? Yeah, yeah, Stephen Ray, yeah, yeah. And, um, which is very good. And, and I remember reading the book um, after getting into the story, and that's the killer murdered in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and thinking, I really, I really, I don't find the, the real detective interesting. He was kind of caught in the system, but he wasn't really rebelling against it. And the nature of these, this, uh, his investigation didn't, it, I don't know, there was something about it that didn't work for me as a, I, didn't, I couldn't imagine what I'd do with it as a writer, in short. That, you, that, that in a sense, uh, I think he's called uh, Cullen, the guy who worked um, at the Cullen Department. I couldn't imagine what I'd do that he hadn't done very well in documenting the real case. But I was like, what if you took that case and you put it in the height of Stalinist Russia? That was, that was the, the sort of the decision I made. And the reason I put it there was because it was the most extreme part of that, of the communist regime. So it was it was at its most lethal, its most dangerous. So at that point, if you were to oppose the state, you'd lose your life. And so that made it logically the most dangerous place to put that story. Um, and then you know, the broader question of why the, 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 the setting, I just have always found totalitarian regimes, I guess there's a kind of interest in them. So it was, uh, that, was that was sort of the nature of that movement. 
How has um, how, how your book been received in Russia? Uh, it's a good question in the sense that it took a while for them to really publish it. And in the end, it was a, it was a newer house, the sort of traditional, I'm not an expert in Russian publishing, but this is what I'm, I'm repeating sort of slightly shaky bits of fact that I've been told. But anyway, so the older, more established houses refused to. This newer house came along and uh, said, yeah, well, we really like it, we're going to publish it. And they've done very well with it. It's been, you know, I think, I think they sold 30, 40,000 copies, which is um, quite a lot for a, a, a book in Britain and English translated into Russian. And it did very well in terms of, I expected lots of, I mean, you were nervous because, um, I mean, Russians are very critical about Westerners writing about Russia. I mean, in a sense, everyone is about people writing about if they don't live in the country. Everyone is a little bit, but Russians are extra critical. They even have a phrase <laughs> for the mistakes that Westerners make. They, they call them cranberries, which uh, loses something in translation, I admit. <laughs> but uh, allegedly it's a devastating No, not cranberry. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it, you know, in Russia, that's that's a real insult. But uh, uh, so, and, and I was really worried about it. I thought, well, let's see what happens. I mean, I had been a little tricky. Like it, London has now a big Russian community, and so I was able to give the book to a few people and have them read it, and before it was published, and have a lot of feedback. So I had already tried to check everything in that sense, um, and I haven't really had any. Um, Maybe so they can't translate the email and stuff. Like, what does that mean? I, I presume it's good. <laughs> I presume they love it. Um, I'm not good at Google Translate. Nice. I've heard from them again. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a lady, yeah. Um, what was the inspiration for the romance in Child Yeah, the romance, uh, it came about through. Leo was always very obvious as the starting point in the sense that I knew I wanted to take a detective who had been richly awarded for arresting innocent people, political prisoners, and have him risk everything by arresting someone who was genuinely guilty. That seemed to be a really interesting um, shape for that character. And then I, I could just see how he evolved from that point. And then I thought, well, his wife, who is his wife? Now, he would have to be married. And then I thought, this character, what I cannot stand is, is when you have to have a character and they do absolutely nothing. So I thought, she has to be as important as him. So how can she be as important as him? And I thought um, it would be interesting if she represented, um, <clears throat> in a sense, what he tries to impress. So his journey of redemption is about making her fall in love with him. And she's married him out of fear. And there is a brilliant moment where he realizes that she said yes to him. She said yes to the marriage, not because she found him attractive or she loved him, but because she thought if she said no, he would have her arrested and sent to the gulag. So immediately I then started to think, who would that woman be? And that suddenly became very interesting to me. And she became a sort of, someone who was very critical of the system. Um, so she was a real thinker. Uh, and he is a man of action in a sense. And she is this, um, she is the intellect. And so therefore as a partner, you know, we, we, in, 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 this is going back to something that's in the seats in the tradition of, of these, these stories is that you have um, partners working on a crime. And I thought, well, in this case, they're literally partners, they're husband and wife. And you have them have different skills. You have Leo is full of this sort of desire to do things. She is the real thinker. So as a team, they suddenly become very interesting. So that was really how the relationship came about. And I thought once he's given up his relationship with the state, because he genuinely believes in the beginning, he has to then redirect his idealism into something else, his love and his romance into her. So he needs to convince her to love him. And that's the sort of shape of the whole book, and that was that was how she came about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really worth it. Wow, that's beautiful, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's that tear. Beautiful, <laughs> man. Really, it's really yeah. nice. David, you got a question? Um, now that I know that the farm is based on this true story, I think there's one other element that you haven't talked about that adds that unease, and that is that the narrator, the young, the son has himself a secret, and this used to be this tight-knit family, and there's a problem that he has, and he brings that vulnerability into his role as listener, which, and that adds an element of tension, and I, I, I was wondering, how did you, do, it's clear that you decided to make the, the narrative different from you, and the fact that he comes from a family where um, there were these secrets that he never saw, that was t totally typical from you. 
But I, I thought that was just a stroke of genius by making him also have something that he is terrified of disclosing and disrupting this illusion of peace and perfection that this family has always had. And was that something where you would you'd like done a draft and you go, you know, I don't know if it's working yet. I need to do something else. Or did that come immediately? Or at what point in the process did that idea come to you? I mean, it's, I mean, I think for me, if you were to boil all of the, 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 the TV series, Child 44, The Farm, it's easy to see them as very different because there are different settings, there are different styles, different forms, but they're really about knowing yourself and people hiding things and how you can be extremely close to someone and yet suddenly they are revealed as something completely different. I find that fascinating uh, and, I, and scary as well. It's a scary... It's a scary concept. Um, it can also be a positive concept, but I think if you know, if I was going to boil it all down, it would be that that this idea of these personal secrets and um, so, in a sense, almost before I start writing, that element is in everything. I mean, that's my sort of that runs into everything. And there's a scene in Child Forty Four where um, uh, Raisa comes back, and uh, the parents have been talking to Leo, and Leo has said. Um, you know, I'm gonna, you know, actually I won't give that away if you haven't read it. But uh, it's again, it's about a personal secret. And in The London Spy, the story is about um, uh, a, a couple, and one half of the couple is hiding the fact that he is working for the intelligence agencies, as you are meant to do. You're not meant to, if you meet someone, tell, oh, I work for MI5 or MI6. So you have to keep that a secret until you get married at some point, or until you trust them enough to tell them. And um, so there, all these secrets are being hidden. I'd like it as a, as a, as a, I don't, as an energy, as a thing to explore. These, these, these personal secrets are at the key to all of the books. So whenever I hear them as, as spoken about as being very different to me, I always feel that 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 question that you ask is at, at, at the heart of all of them. Seems fair. Um, I, I'm looking at the clock, and it's uh, it looks like it's time for us to go. Unless there's one more last question, one more. No? Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Is the London Spy, is it a contemporary or is it historical? It's contemporary, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 <It's> contemporary. <laughs>